All right, so turn your Bibles again to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is part 18 of our series set apart for God's service. And we had a, a privilege last week to look at the uh, sincerity of spiritual gifts. And sincerity and uh, spiritual gifts must go hand in hand. And it cannot be separated. Love and giftedness, love and theology, love and, and service and sacrifice. So sincerity and spiritual gifts cannot be separated. Spiritual gifts is from the Holy Spirit, right? And love is the fruit of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts is the tool to edify the church. It's not gimmick, it's not activity, or it's not program that edifies the church, but the spiritual gifts that edifies the church. But love is the power to use that tool. Love is the motivation to build the church of Christ. And so Christian service must be sincere. And to be sincere must have the virtue of love. So we talked about that last week in 1 Corinthians 13, and we will continue that um, next, next week. Now again, I want to go back to a verse from last week, and this time I want to take you through the study process of verse 31. Verse 31, so please stand and let's read beginning in verse 27. Uh, please stand, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? And here's the verse. But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. You may now take your seat. So the verse we want to go back today is verse 31. And the title of our study this morning is do we have to desire greater gift? Do we have to desire greater gift? So if you're a Christian, you have a spiritual gift. You're not a natural person. You're a supernatural person. And God gave you spiritual gifts, a unique gifts. And let me read that to you again. But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. So there's a dispute among Christians uh, regarding this verse, and majority will say that this verse is a command. Majority will say that this verse is a command, imperative, while others, like myself, will say that this verse is a statement of fact, indicative, statement of fact. It's because the Greek indicative and imperative are identical. The Greek reading and imperative indicative are identical. Imperative means command. Indicative means Paul is giving a statement of fact. Paul is giving a statement of fact. So I'm inclined to the um, indicative form, not the imperative form. I believe Paul is not giving a command here, but a statement of fact. Indicative. I believe he's correcting them, not commanding them. And today I want to share with you why you know, what I mentioned last week is the, uh, what I um, kind of delivered to you last week is the finished product of my study. I gave you what you need to know. I didn't explain the process last week. Uh, what I gave you is the body and not the uh, skeletal part of my study. But today I want to show you how I handle this verse. I want to show you the process. And I think spending time with this verse is important to those who highly view God's Word. And so if you love the Word of God, you want to know the process, the process of studying. And I know you're serious about word of, the Word of God, and so I believe uh, we are concerned 
about the proper handling of God's Word? Are you concerned with the proper examination of God's Word? If you're a student of God, a disciple of Christ, you must be concerned, right? How to handle the Scripture. Now, I think the contention is this word. If you look at verse 31 again, the word earnestly desire. So in Greek, that's just one word. Earnestly desire. And if you look at also the adjective there, greater, greater gift. In some translation, a higher gift. In some translation, a better gift or best gift. And again, here's the verse, earnestly desire greater gift. It's the adjective greater gift. And also, if you turn your Bibles to um, chapter 14 in verse 1, you will encounter this verse again. In verse 1, it says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly. That's one word again. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So there's the contention. They believe that the greater gifts is the uh, um, prophecy. Now, if you go down to um, the last two verses of chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39 to 40, it says there, Therefore, my brethren, desire, and here's again, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. So how do we understand this? Apostle Paul is simply saying, if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 14, verse 1, Paul is simply saying here that the fact that love triumphs spiritual gifts, that's why he said pursue love, the fact that love triumphs spiritual gifts does not mean that spiritual gifts is to be disregarded. That's just what Paul is saying there. And perhaps you ask, um, well, how about the word especially? How about the word especially in verse 1? But especially that you may prophesy. Is that the same idea uh, in verse 31 of chapter 12? Earnestly desire or greater gifts. Is that the same word? Is that the same idea? Can we use this to explain chapter 12 verse 31? Is this the answer for uh, verse 31 in, in chapter 12? Is the prophecy the greater gift? In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. So that's the question. And the answer to this is, of course, no. Why? Well, the word specially is a, a comparative adverb, right? Referring to what is better, better than what? Well, if you read the passage, Paul is comparing prophecy with what? With your Bibles. Verses 1 to 5. Is Paul comparing the... Prophecy to, to all the gifts, he's just comparing what? Prophecy with tongues. With tongues. Paul is comparing prophecy with a specific gift. That is the tongue. It is comparison between prophecy and tongues. He's not comparing with all spiritual gifts, but only to a particular gift. Specific gifts, and that is the gift of tongues. In other words, if you put... Prophecy and, and tongues um, side by side, Paul prefers prophecy, prophecy than tongues. And he's not saying here, he's not saying here, beloved, desire prophecy because it's great and you don't have it. It's, he's not saying that. But Paul is making a comparison to which one is better between two specific gifts. What's that again? Prophecy and tongues, very good. Which are both what? Prophecy and tongues are what? Both greater gifts. Why? Because they are speaking gifts. Speaking gifts. So Paul is comparing two greater gifts. He's not comparing lesser to greater, but he's comparing two greater gifts, which one is good, which one is better. And if you read chapter 14, the main theme of that is for the edification of the church. You can read that. That word, edification, it's all over chapter 14. That's the purpose of that. 
In fact, if you're um, using King James Version of the Bible, instead of using especially, it says there, but rather, rather that ye may prophesy. It's a preference. It's, Paul is referring or preferring uh, prophecy over tongues. And then Paul will explain why in the following verses. But the point that I'm making is we cannot use, listen, we cannot use 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 1 to justify 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31 as an imperative. We cannot use chapter 14 verse 1 to justify the imperative reading of verse 31 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and conclude that Paul is commanding us to desire prophecy. And again, we will look at chapter 14 when we get there. In the meantime, I want you to focus to this verse, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. We will study 1 Corinthians 14 next time. Now, when I'm studying a passage, here's my goal. The author's intended meaning. When you're studying the passage of Scripture, your goal is to find the author's intended meaning. What the author is saying. And what does he mean but what he said? Let me give you four words to remember to keep it simple. First word, content. Content. By that I mean you need to look at the words and phrases and languages. And, and this is the, uh, the nuts and bolts in, in um, exegetical process. Content. Observing the text and the structure of the text. And for the sake of time, uh, we just want to pay attention to uh, this one word. Earnestly desire. Earnestly desire. Because that's the main concern we want to deal with. Now in looking at the uh, content, I need to ask some question. And so when, you're, when I'm studying the Word of God, and here's the Word, I'm going to ask myself, what do Paul mean by this Word? The word desire means to burn with zeal. The word earnestly desire means burning with emotional intensity. It's a very strong word. In fact, it has the idea of bubbling and, and boiling. Really deep desire. In fact, in, in um, King James Version, um, they use the word covet, right? If you're using the King James Version, covet. But covet earnestly the best gives. Now, I also need to ask how this word use. That's the meaning of the word. And so how this word use in other passages in other books of the Bible. And I need to begin with Paul because he wrote Corinthians. And so you want to know how Paul used this word in, in his different uh, letters or writings. And I also want to know how he uses this word in his other letters, and I also need to know how the New Testament writers utilize this word. I need to know also how the translators translated this word. Translators, like, you know, if you're using ESV, NASB, NIV, you want to check that. And this word was used many times by Paul in 1 Corinthians. And we saw that, right, in chapter 14, verse 1, and in verse 39. He also um, used this in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 4. And he uses this in a negative way. Let me read that to you. Love is patient, love is kind, and it's not jealous. The word jealous, that's the same word in verse 31. And he used that in a negative tone. And so this word is translated as covet. It can be translated as jealous. In fact, Paul uses this word in Galatians twice. Uh, James uses uh, this word once. In James chapter 4, verse 2, it was translated as envious. Envious. And so from here, I can see that this word is used negatively. Negatively, covet, jealous, envious, it's a negative word. But of course, this can be used in a positive way. For example, if you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 11, 
verse 2. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul, in verse 2, he said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. The word jealous there is the same word, earnestly desire, in verse 31 in 1 Corinthians 12. And so you can use this in a positive way, like Paul here in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 2. And here Paul is, again, he said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealous. And so the word desire, meaning to burn with zeal, can be used negatively or positively. But Paul and other writers, and here's the word, commonly, usually, repeatedly use this word in a negative way. In a negative way. Now, I don't stop there. I need to ask some questions again. And I need to ask is, um, what is the uh, grammatical structure of this word? What is the uh, grammatical structure of this word? And the word earnestly desire is a, is a verb. It is a verb. Um, if you parse the, this word, it is in present tense, meaning to say it's an ongoing action. It's an ongoing action. It is imperative, meaning it is an action word. And so if you read it, be desiring. It's an active voice, meaning I need to do the action. And so if you're parsing a verb, there is the middle voice, meaning to say you do the action to yourself. And the passive voice means someone, uh, someone else is doing the action to you. And if it's an active voice, you're doing the action. And so here, um, we can see that this is an action word. This is a verb. This is an ongoing action. And I need to do the action. Now, second is, it's in uh, plural. And so, Paul is kind of telling that we all need to do this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. And so, to summarize everything here for the content, the word earnestly, desire, is a strong word that means to burn with zeal, with emotional zeal, and it's usually used negatively. It has a negative connotation. The translator translates this word to covet or uh, envious or jealous, and it's in present tense. It's a verb, an action. It's an active voice, which means I need to do the action. It's in plural, which means we all need to do the action. Now, the question is, is this enough to say that verse 31 is imperative? Are you still with me? Of course, no, because words alone don't determine the meaning of a passage, true? Words alone don't determine the meaning of the passage. So what's the next process? After examining the content, you need to move to context. Context, right? And so the, rea uh, the realtors, um, they said, you know, location, location, location. In a Bible study or Bible reading, it's context, context, context. Context is king. And so the second word that I want you to remember is context. And again, let me read the verse again. But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. And again, we all know that context is king in biblical interpretation, since Greek indicative and imperative forms are similar, again, Greek indicative and imperative are similar, identical, and so context will determine if this verb is imperative, a command, or indicative, a statement of fact. Context will determine that. Context will help us um, determine if this is uh, imperative or indicative. Now, what's the context of verse 31? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12. Right at the beginning of chapter 12, Paul is stressing three things. Beginning in um, verse 1 to verse 30, Paul is stressing three things here. And what is that? Spiritual gifts, the unity of spiritual gifts, the diversity, and the mutual dependence of spiritual gifts. And he's stressing this principle in, is it in a positive way or a negative way? He's stressing three things here. 
unity of gifts, diversity of gifts, and the mutual dependence, the interdependence of gifts. Now the question is, is he stressing this principle or principles, is it in a positive way or in a negative way? Is actually correcting their sinful behavior, true? The Corinth church is a problematic church. Paul points out God's sovereignty in distributing the gifts and our response and responsibility are to be content with what we have. Meaning the spiritual gifts that you have. He's saying here that we're all part of one body, the body of Christ. That's why he said, the foot cannot say because I am not a hand, I'm not part of the body. Paul is correcting them. The ear cannot say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. And so we cannot say that. We cannot say that. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Paul is correcting them. This is in a negative context. Paul is correcting their sinful behavior. Paul is correcting their um, envious behavior. Their, uh, their divisive behavior, right? Right in the beginning of chapter 1, you can see that they're divided. And so that's the context of verse 31. And therefore, it is impossible to interpret verse 31 on its context to be an imperative. It's impossible. It cannot be an appeal to seek the showier gifts. Listen, the Corinthian church clearly prize prominent gifts. They want showier gifts. That's the problem of the Corinthian church. They want to be showy. They want to be prominent. They want the greater gifts. And so it's foolishness to command them to do what they were already eagerly doing. Right? And that's actually the problem that Paul is trying to correct. Now another context is, um, what do we mean by greater gift? Well, what do we mean by that? In chapter 12, Paul uses the illustration of the body, right? In chapter 12, you can see Paul is using the illustration of the body. The greater gift is the, uh, the visible gift, the prominent, the, the, the public, like the speaking gift. It's more on the front. That's the greater gift that you can see there. Like speaking gifts of prophecy, speaking in tongues, exhortation. Those are the greater gift. Now the lesser gift is the less visible, less prominent, and, and usually uh, you know, working backstage, unnoticed. And, and these are the uh, serving gifts, like the um, helps, or, or um, mercy, or administration. And so greater gifts could mean, in summary, the speaking gifts. However, in context, we see Paul also mention not only the uh, spiritual gifts, but also what? If you look at verse 27, take a guess. He's not also speaking about spiritual gifts, but in verse 27, he's also talking about the gifted office, right? The apostles, the prophets, the teachers. And so we need to ask ourselves, what's the greater gift? What is he referring to? Is he referring to uh, the gifted, the spiritual gifts? Or is he referring to the gifted office? The apostles and the prophets. So basically, it's not clear. And so therefore, if this is a command, an imperative, earnestly decide greater gift. And so we ask Paul, Paul, um, are you referring to the speaking gifts, the greater gift? Or are you referring to the gifted office, which is the, uh, the greater gifted office is the apostles and the prophets? Are you referring to that, Paul? You see, you're going to end up with a lot of unanswered question if you take this in imperative reading. And so I'm just showing you that there's a problem in imperative reading. Now, the other option, which is uh, the indicative reading, the other option is a statement of fact. And this is more appropriate to the context. Again, Paul is not commanding them. Paul is not commanding you to desire the gift of prophecy. He's not commanding us. Let me read that to you again. But earnestly desire the greater gifts, 
and I show you a still more excellent way. In the appropriate context of this reading is the indicative. The context is what precedes verse 1 to 30 and what follows, which is chapter 13, right? And so the indicative reading is consistent with chapter 13. Uh, this tells us that the value and importance of gifts does not lie in their greatness or prominence, but the value is sincerity. That's why Paul said here in, in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Meaning to say, even if you have a greater gift, if you're not sincere, it doesn't mean anything. It's meaningless. It's vain. And so, the indicative reading is more consistent. Paul is correcting them. Because why? They're, they're uh, seeking for greater prominence, greater gifts. And so here, I don't see any justification that Paul is commanding them. And the only way to make this imperative, listen, the only way to make this imperative, meaning 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, is to take that out from its context, right? And use that just a proof text. But proof text without a context is not a text. Verse must be in, in its context. Now, the third word that I wanna, that I want you to remember is uh, consistency. So content, you want to check that, context, and then consistency. The goal is the author's intended meaning. And the question is, which one is consistent with the author's argument? Is it imperative or indicative? And I believe without a doubt it's in indicative. The tone of the book is negative. The tone of the chapter is negative. Meaning the book, 1 Corinthians, the whole book of 1 Corinthians, it's negative. It's a corrective book. The tone of the chapter is negative. The meaning of the word has a negative connotation. And so, beloved, there's nothing in the flow of Paul's argument to expect a command. Listen, if each gift is necessary to build up the body of Christ, then why, why is Paul telling the Corinthian church to desire gifts that they don't have? At least yet. And so if... If Paul is commanding them, hey, use your spiritual gifts, it's necessary to build up the body of Christ. We cannot say to Paul, well, Paul, we're still praying for it. We're still desiring that gift. We cannot do what you're telling us. That's kind of not consistent. You know, we cannot say to, to Paul, uh, we don't have it yet. We don't have yet the, the gift of prophecy. We're still desiring it. We're still praying for it. We're still waiting for this one gift. The greater gift. We cannot uh, obey um, you know, to, um, to use our gifts. So that's absurd. And the only way to be consistent with the author's flow of thought is the indicative form. Another thing you want to consider in terms of consistency is conviction. And so you want to check the content, the context, the consistency, and conviction. And when I say conviction, beloved, I always read my Bible in God-centered way. What do I mean by that? From God to me. From God to man. I don't read my Bible from man to God. I don't read my Bible man-centered way. I'm comfortable with God's sovereignty. Are you comfortable with God's sovereignty? I don't mind Him taking over my life. I don't mind Him taking over my life, taking over my desire, taking over my will. In fact, I beg for it. Please, Lord, take over. Because I know he's good. And listen, the word of God is about God. Not about me, not about you. About God, but it's for you. It's for you. Not about us, but for us. And that conviction affects my study. If you look at um, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11 for a moment.
In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. Meaning God. And I believe in the moment of salvation, God already gave us the gifts we need to serve the body of Christ. It's complete. It lacks nothing. Why? Because the church is about who? About God. All we need to do is to discover it. All we need to do is to employ the gift and appreciate it. At the end of the day, the gift is not for personal use. Your spiritual gifts is not for you. It's for the church. Why? Because the church is not about It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about God, but it's for us. But for the edification of the church, that's the purpose of spiritual gifts. And God knows what he needs for his church. Why? Because the church is about God. And so he he knows what he needs. He knows what we need. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he is, who? he is the head of the church. I don't, tell the head, I don't tell the head what I need. Okay? I don't tell him what I need. He knows what I need. Why? Because the church is about God. And therefore, I don't need to desire greater gift for myself. He knows it. Just as he wills. Listen, if Paul is commanding them to desire a greater gift, to do that is both presumptuous. To do that is both presumptuous and purposeless. Every believer is already perfectly gifted by God. You have a unique gift given by God. According to his plan, according to his will. And so you don't seek greater gifts. You don't seek that. You already have it. And what we need to do is to activate and cultivate it and use it. Our responsibility is not to seek greater gifts. Our, uh, our responsibility is to be content with our gifts. That's our responsibility. Besides, the value of gifts does not lie in its greatness. The value of gifts does not lie in its greatness. But where? Chapter 13, but where? In sincerity. So it doesn't matter if you have a gift of prophecy, if you're not sincere. That's nothing. Besides, the value of gifts does not lie in its greatness, but in sincerity. That's why Paul said in second half of verse 31, And I show you a still more excellent way. But you desire, earnestly desire greater gift, but I will show you. A better way. I will show you more excellent way. Paul is correcting them. It's indicative. It's a statement of fact. He's not commanding them. I will show you a better way. I will show you what is great. I will show you uh, what is more valuable, which is sincerity in Christian service. So again, we will look at chapter 14 next time. In the meantime, I want to give you some application for a study. It's our duty to know our spiritual gifts. That is your duty. If you're a Christian, it's your duty to know your spiritual gifts. Second, it's your duty to apply and to to activate and to practice your spiritual gifts. And not doing so is disobedience to God. It's actually sin not to practice um, your spiritual gift. It's a terrible sin. However, if we do our duty without love, that's also a sin. And because Christian service requires sincerity, and I know there are things we do, um, there are things that we do out of duty, and we need to teach ourselves to love. You know, sometimes you do things because you have to, because it's your duty, and sometimes we need to teach ourselves to be sincere, because sometimes we do things just for duty's sake. Maybe you go to church just for duty's sake. Well, I have to go to church, you know. 
I'm a Christian, and so, you know, I'll, I'll be, I should be in church, but not sincere. And so we need to teach ourselves to be sincere. We live in a sinful world, and sometimes we don't get the job we love, right? And sometimes we don't get the boss we like, and we don't get the neighbors we want. Even we don't get the church we want. And then we end up just obeying our duty without sincerity. And there's uh, this constant disconnection. There is this constant disconnection between duty and sincerity. In other words, we don't get what we want, and if we don't get what we want, it's hard to be sincere. And our natural reaction is to what? To be discontent. Our natural reaction is to be dissatisfied, to be displeased. And therefore, what I'm saying here, therefore the imperative reading of our text this morning can do more harm. Why? Because it invites a believer to be discontent, it, it in, invites a believer to be, um, to be displeased with his gift. And of course, I know that there's holy discontent, there's holy ambition, that's true. But if we're not careful, it can lead us to um, envy and jealousy, right? If we're not careful. And so the imperative reading of this verse, the imperative understanding of this verse pushes us to the edge of sin, instead of pulling us away from it. It's kind of inviting you not to be content with, with your gifts. And I want to encourage you to look at verse 1 Corinthians again. I want to encourage you to look at this in an indicative form. The context, the content, consistency, and conviction leads us to this conclusion that verse 31 it's an indicative, it's a statement of fact. It's, Paul is correcting them. And be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman, not a shame. Accurately handling the word of truth. Now, if we're on the same page on this, if we, are, if we landed on the same page, let me give you three responsibilities Three words again. First, be content with what you have. Be content with your gift. It's unique and only you have that. Be content with what you have. Spiritual gifts. Second is to cultivate it. In other words, discover it. God already gave his spirit to you and your job is to work it out. Cultivate your gift. And the third word is charge it. In other words, use it. Use it. Be content with your gift. Don't desire prophecy. Be content with what you have. God already gave you His Spirit, and so cultivate it, discover it, practice it, and then use it. Let's pray. Father, what a joy to study your word. It makes wise the simple, and may your word be the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. Open our eyes that we may see your wondrous works. Satisfy us with your word. And may you honor the man who honors your word. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.